slide. So I'm Josh Pressers. I am the vice president of security at a company called Anchor. We do Sift and Gripe. Uh, Sift is a SBOM scanner. Gripe is a vulnerability scanner. We have an enterprise product called Anchor Enterprise. I've been, I'm on the open SSF TAC. I've been doing this open source thing for 20 some years now. It's, I, I have a story I always tell where when I started out my career and I, I went to work for a Linux startup, I had people legitimately tell me I'm throwing my career away on this open source crap. Like, I think we did all right. But, uh, and, and then also I'm one of the co-founders of the GSD project, which is what we are going to talk about today. And I have a co-presenter here who will introduce himself. Hi everybody, I'm the other Josh B, so Josh That's Baker. Right. Josh B and Josh B. <laughs> it's fun. Um, I work for the Cloud Security Alliance, a global nonprofit. Uh, we focus on building the cybersecurity community and push forward best practices that are vendor neutral. Um, global, Star global security database being one of those new projects. So, yeah. Awesome. All right, cool. So let's start out with just asking the question. Did my clicker work? Didn't nope. Work. Why didn't it work? Oh, it turned off. All right, there we go. There we go. What is the global security database? Right? So there's a lot of crazy history behind this, and we're not going to go into a ton of it, but fundamentally, what this is turned into is a repository of identifiers that are meant to be an open source project that is a way to track security information, we'll call it, right? It's not about vulnerabilities necessarily. It's not about malware. It's not about one thing. And there is a number of projects, we'll hear about some of them here. There's, there's more than we can count as well where I think it has become apparent that there's all this security information out there and it's been really difficult to bring it together. And yeah. that's one of our intents. No, please. Yeah, and one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit later too is also not just the vulnerabilities themselves, but the discussion as well. Um, <laughs> avoiding some of the uh, misplaced communication channels, we'll say. That's right, that's right. And I also want to, I guess, start this conversation off with that Josh and I are up here presenting and we have a whole bunch of slides, we have a whole bunch of content, and I think it would be a shame if all we did was talk. So as you have questions, as you have thoughts, please speak up, argue with us. There's nothing better than a good argument, especially in the world of security, right? And so by all means, engage, and, and we're here to converse. We're not here to expel, right? That's, that's not the intent. Okay, so where are we today? And, and I like to describe this as modern vulnerability identifiers, and specifically vulnerabilities, we'll say in this context, is it's become difficult to find them all. And we have a slide coming up in a couple that kind of it lays out this ecosystem, but there's tons of sources. There's things like CVE, there's things like GitHub, there's, no, I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it. We'll I, do that later, we, in we, a minute. We <laughs> put this in our notes not to do this right here where we start naming everything. So, and, <laughs> and, and so, right, there's all these weird problems. And I, I don't wanna obsess over the problems. That's not why we're here, right? We are all here because we understand this is a space that has enormous opportunity, right? And so we wanna focus on, on what we can do to help. Yeah, and to add to that too, I think one of the things is that no one person or group is gonna have the right answer as well. So getting everyone together in an open source project so we can collaborate and do through practice rather than try to theory craft a, a perfect answer up front. Exactly, exactly. Very open source. Okay, so this part of the presentation, I, I don't, when you say this out loud, everyone realizes it's true, but everyone doesn't always realize it's true. So if I take the vulnerability scanner gripe that my company has created, and I scan for vulnerabilities. It's open source, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an open source project. Anyone can contribute all that jazz. There's another open source vulnerability scanner called Trivi that's done by Aqua Security, which is you know, technically a competitor of Anchor, but in the open source world, we all get along. If I scan something with Gripe and then I scan something with Trivi, I'm going to get different results. And is it because one scanner is better or worse than the other? Or is it because all of the data is not machine readable but often when it is machine readable, it's because it's part of someone else's data set and it's probably locked up behind a gate somewhere and it's because they've done a bunch of work on it maybe. So this is all about like the data formats, right? It is, it is difficult to find this data and to do something with it. And okay, I'll keep going. I can talk for hours. <laughs> like <laughs> Josh is here to, to keep me in check, I think. 
And then the, the bit, the last point on here, I think is one of the most important that uh, today Twitter is the best source of vulnerability information we have. No, that's not, don't put your thumb, come on, Al, no. <laughs> oh, okay, you're green. <laughs> Good. And <laughs> Perfect. So, I mean, we have, why, why is Twitter winning, right? This is one of the questions that Josh and I and, and the other fellow we work with named Kurt Seifried, who couldn't be here today, but we talk about this all the time. All right, Josh, I'm, I, I've talked too much. Tell right. us why Twitter's winning. Yeah, so Twitter makes it really easy. So there's no barrier to entry to actually submit any information to it. If you want to talk about some crazy vulnerability that you're seeing in Log4J or whatever, um, you can just go on Twitter, post about it, add a hashtag, and that is a way for you to get into the conversation and add your own two cents to it. Um, maybe create a logo. <laughs> maybe make a logo, yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then the other thing too is like it's easy to search Twitter and find stuff, well, kind of, sort of. Yeah, it, you can kind of search, but it's not great. It's also not machine readable. So um, yep. that's one of the areas that yeah. I guess we'll talk about a little bit more later. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, so for anyone who doesn't know, the, the log for shell picture, there's a fellow, uh, Kevin Beaumont, and he goes by Gossi the dog on Twitter. Like he made that as a joke and everyone started using it, which was just like <laughs> that chef's kiss, right? For just being awesome for this. But in all seriousness, for anyone who is paying attention to log for shell the literal best source of information we had was following Gossie the dog on Twitter. Like, the, the, it was an enormous service he did for all of us, which is terrifying in some ways, but thank goodness he did. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I think we're trying to address with a project like this is rather than having to follow a whole bunch of different Twitter accounts and see, like, okay, what's going on? Is there any crazy stuff today? Um, actually have, like, a, a genuine input of, oh, this is security relevant. I should be paying attention to this and also have it be machine readable so you can feed it into any automations as opposed to try to scrape Twitter, whatever you can find for the feeds. So. That is one of my favorite things. So I, I have friends and, and family members who will say, you know, what do you do? Explain your job to me. And it's basically, well, I get up and I check Twitter to see if there's anything I need to worry about. <laughs> and, then I, and then I look at my backlog. And I joke when I say that, but it's not entirely wrong, which is scary and awesome. Okay, so one of the first things people will say, and I actually um, argued this with a bunch of the GitHub folks last night, is when we talk about anyone being able to update vulnerability data, they say, but anyone can update the vulnerability data. Like, you can't let that happen. And the thing I remind everyone is when I started my open source career back in the, the early days, in the early 2000s, do you know what everyone would say when you explain how open source worked? They said, so you're telling me anyone can update this project? How can you trust them? There's no way that works. And I think the fact that if you look at this show, you look at all of us here, you look at you know, us up here and then the front, open source works. No one's gonna argue that, right? Open source won. It's not even just that it works, it works so well, it has destroyed the competition. And so every time I hear someone say, you can't possibly rely on the community to send you. Oh no. Didn't. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> we had a lot of technical difficulties getting that screen to work, so. It's, had traumatic flashbacks yes, to the it's like <laughs> minutes before the presentation. That's right, that's right. So anyway, there is no reason we should be saying, but we can't trust the community. We trust the community to run literally all of our infrastructure. We trust the community to send stuff to space. We trust the community for our lives. The medical devices that keep people alive are running open source. So I don't buy that at all, that there's somehow some advantage to locked up proprietary data, especially for vulnerabilities. It is not true. I would say this is one of those instances where prove me wrong because all of the evidence says open source works and it's awesome. Yeah, and something to add to that too is if it's open source, then anyone can look into it, as well as with it being easier to update and edit this data, if something does go wrong, we can go through and quickly correct it as well. That's so. right. Yep, yep. And you can see who did it, right? How many times, how many of us know what Git Blame does, right? I love the fact that they named it literally Blame, because every time we've, what did they used to call it in the CVS days? Was it Annotate, I think, where it would show you? So, so for those of you who don't know, there's a command with Git called Git Blame. 
And Git Blame will show you which line was committed by a certain person, right? Because so, obviously when there's a bug, you want to know who you're going to blame. You know, we, uh, we've all been there when you're doing development. And, and, and in fact, in the early days, I remember we would literally run like CVS annotate on the code to be like, we got to go yell at this guy. Like he screwed up the build. And, and so anyway, that, that's part of what open source. All right, here we are. Here we are, our favorite slide. This is, so, so Josh and I started talking, well, we started working on this a couple weeks ago, right? Probably yeah. two, three weeks. And we said, we want a slide where we put all of the vulnerability sources we could think of on a slide. So if you're part of a project and you're not on there, it's not that we don't like you, we just couldn't think of it. We literally pulled this out of our butts talking on a Zoom call, and that's how big the list is. There's way more than this. Literally just the ones that came to mind. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. And, and so this is part of the challenge, is if you're an organization who's dealing with vulnerability data today, this is what you need to look at. Now, some of these, I will say, are, are private. Like, we've got uh, Sneaks up there. There's Twistlock up there. There's um, White, White Source actually just changed your logo. I, see, I put White Source on there. But you get the idea. Some of these are private. Some of these are not private. Some of them are public. But this is one of the challenges we have, is how do we take all of this data, how do we turn it into something everyone can use? And there's always the arguments of, oh, we should all come together and have one thing. And like, I'm not going to argue that's necessarily bad, but competition is always good. So I'm not saying we should have one particular source necessarily, but uh oh, I do think that's too many. I'll just randomly tap on right. the, no, that's fine. the that's keyboard fine. and they'll keep it's, it away. Ah, whatever. What's that? Oh, okay. All right, if you say so. <laughs> we'll see. See, that's right. <laughs> it's always the infrastructure, right? Right. It's DNS. I'm certain it's DNS's fault. All right, all right, Josh, take it away. Um, yeah. So one of the things with this data is being able to integrate it into your CI/CD pipeline. So making it easy for you to pull in whatever the data feeds are, check it against your SBOM or your packages, and see which ones are vulnerable to which versions. Is there a fix available? Can you deploy that immediately? Um, and making that easy is one of the things that is important for automation. And with Ruby and NPM, what they've ended up doing is taking in, for example, like the CVE or the NVD data feeds and augmenting it to say, hey, it affects this specific package, this specific version range. And being able to push that back upstream is one of the... Th okay, just ignore just, it. Okay, It'll so do it anyways. Okay. Right, right. Um, so pushing up that data so that others can reuse it as opposed to everyone having to have their own special, we're going to augment this with our own format, that kind of a thing. That's right. That's right. For, and, and for anyone who's ever done anything like this before, every language now seems to have their own data set, which I mean, it, it, it's totally reflected there, right? Like, yeah. They all have their own special thing. Bundle and now, audit, urine audit, et cetera, et cetera. Yep, yep. Most of them are public, which is great but it still sucks because you have to go find it and figure out what to do with it. Um, all right, formats. Talk about the formats. All right. Um, I guess, do you want to start on the OSV stuff? And Yeah, yeah. So if we look at the little, um, do I have OSV on here? No, I don't have OSV on this one. Is that? No, that is OSV. OK. I can't, I can't remember. We have so many pictures in this deck. <laughs> uh, the, the, the black box here is a format called OSV. So the Google folks who are here have a project called OSV as well as a data format called OSV. OSV is awesome. If you've never looked at it, it captures a great deal of vulnerability information in a really nice way. It's JSON. It's, it, it's one of those situations where I like to describe it as the OSV data solves a problem. It was created by people doing work versus committees. Now, nothing wrong with yeah, Alan staring at me now. Um, nothing wrong with committees, <laughs> but it is one of those situations where you can plan to death but as soon as you start doing the work, everything changes, right? And so it's an instance of this is, this is the result of, of people doing the work, which I think makes a, a huge difference sometimes. But it's also just it's, it's very lovely. I really, really like the data format. And one thing before we move on to is there's not going to be one right way to do this. There's going to be different use cases that need different data formats as well. Yep. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but this is where namespaces comes into play for the GSD. Um, and also one of the things that like, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to come up with our own data format. We want to lean on the existing stuff. So, for example, like Perl, OSV, VEX, et cetera, not create yet another standard. So That's right. That's right. Uh, let's just keep going. We're, we're going to run ourselves out of time here. Um, yeah. 
All right, so I guess this is the, the last bit before we get onto the good stuff, right? Is like today updating vulnerability data is hard. It shouldn't be hard. It's 2022, right? Come on. And I like putting my quote in someone named Josh. Who said it? <laughs> we don't know. All right, let's get into good stuff. So again, we kind of come back to the, the, the GSD, right? It's part of the Cloud Security Alliance. It's an open source project. And now we're going to kind of show you kind of what we're doing. But first, we know, all right? We all know. Our intent, though, in all seriousness, I put this up slightly in jest just so no one points us out in a few minutes. But more importantly is... The intent we have isn't to create another standard. The intent we have is to find a way to work with the other standards, right? And that's, I think, an important differentiation versus the awesome XKCD comic we all reference all the time, right? All right, all right. I'll let Josh, being the CSA employee, explain why the CSA. Yeah, so one of the big things is that um, well, what's it, what does CSA stand for? Just yeah. to make sure everyone knows. So Cloud Security Alliance, um, we're again, the nonprofit. Um, and one of the big things is that our incentive isn't the data itself. We want to kind of build up the community around this. And, oh gosh. Um, so take over for a second. Yeah, yeah, um, okay. So not a company, right, first of all. We all know that when a company is in charge of an open source project, you run into problems. I worked at Elastic pr prior to Anchor, and there was just a, a keynote about open search. I'll let you work that one out. But, right, we don't want a company involved. Kurt and I are the founders of GSD. We went to the CSA because the CSA has given us an enormous amount of rope to hang ourselves with, which I truly appreciate. So it's kind of, it, it, it's pleasant to work with an organization that's very hands-off, which I really, really like. One of the other aspects to this, why it, it can't be a company, is we have a list here. Every, and now, I, I don't know if the GitHub folks are out in the audience, but um, I, I told them to argue with me. Yes. So every company that has done this has either gone out of business or they've taken their data private because the data was seen as having some sort of monetary value or more importantly, you see many other organizations just taking your data from you and contributing nothing back. Now, there's nothing wrong with that per se. I think if we look at open source, the vast majority of open source projects have far more people consuming them than contributing to them. So it's part of what has to be kept in mind, I think. Like, there will be takers, but we also want to make sure there's people who work together with you. And so this is, and, and I must say, the two blanks are for if anyone has any other databases that have gone private or went away, by all means, speak up. That's kind of where we left it there. But, but and, and fundamentally, like for something like the CSA, we want an open source project that's going to be self-governing and not run by any one organization or person or company. Because, I mean, we've all seen open source projects where, you know, one company takes over or one person takes over and then they have their agenda and they start pushing it. And that, that doesn't help anyone, right? Like this is, this is data that the world needs, okay? All right, all right. 2022, open source one, right? We covered all this stuff. This makes sense, okay? Does anyone disagree? Come on, someone's gotta disagree. <laughs> I mean, we're at the open source summit. <clears throat> What's that? It's the year of the Linux desktop. It is the year of the Linux desktop, and next year will be the year of the Linux desktop, and the year after that, and the year after that. That was, actually, it was really funny. I had a friend who was organizing an event, and they had, like, a timeline of open source, and they put Year of the Linux desktop, I think, in, like, 1999. It's like, it was real small, and you had to know it was there, but it was, like, such a good joke. But, you know, it's funny. I've been running Linux on my desktop since probably 97, maybe? <laughs> like, a really long time. <laughs> so, like, I feel the pain, and every year, it's like, this is the year. I want to believe. I'm like, what was it? Uh, uh, Mulder had the, the poster up in his office in the X-Files with the I want to believe. Yeah, that's me. That's me. Okay. All right. So let's start talking about the most interesting parts of all of this. Namespaces. Do you want to talk about namespaces, Josh? Yeah. Explain so, namespaces. So this is where having the existing feeds, like we showed the slide of like 20 different uh, databases, being able to pull that into one central machine readable place and doing that with each of those databases goes under their own namespace. And one of the other things that we can do this as well is, for example, uh, the New York Presbyterian Hospital. Um, mm -hmm. They have some data. Oh, you said hospital. 
I, I got it right. We, I was thinking when about we were that. talking about this the other day, we kept saying Presbyterian Church instead of hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Up. Sorry. Yeah. Go on. Go on. Um, well done. But they have some data enrichment that they're doing to the NVD data as well. So being able to push that up under your own namespace is one of the things that we're going to be able to support with the GSD project. Well, we do support it. I mean, this yeah. is literally a screenshot from some time. So I'll, I'll kind of start at the beginning. We, we jumped into some content, and we're gonna, we don't have a ton of time here, but I'm going to. So everything you see here is in GitHub. We have a link to GitHub somewhere later on in the deck. But basically, we've taken a bunch of existing data, and we stuffed it into GitHub. We use OSV for a bunch of the data. There's also this made up crap format that's it's at the top. That's what I made up like years ago as, as the start of the tooling. It, it's going to go away at some point in the near future because it's terrible, but that's fine. Like that's how open source works, right? Like terrible data, no big deal. You just patch it. It's how, it's how it is. Yeah, and two quick additions to that too. One of the things we can do with this is support researchers adding content under their own specific that's right. namespace. That's right. Um, and then no, I forgot the other parts. <laughs> that's right. That's we'll right. come back to that. So, so if we look up here, we've got it's us CVE. So we also made the GSD identifiers are, we'll call them CVE compatible, where you can basically take any CVE ID, replace CVE with GSD, and it's literally the same ID. And the data will be in this data set. Because if you look here in this namespace, there's an NVD namespace and a CVE namespace. I collapsed them because it, it's a lot of stuff and it just it's hard, to, it's hard to present in a, in a way that makes sense. But the idea is, like, those are read-only data sources. We pull them in from somewhere else, we put them in here. But there's no reason that someone else couldn't add your own namespace for your company, your project, your, yourself as a person, and add commentary. You can add more metadata. You can do any, we can add metadata into the, the higher level GSD namespace, because the intent here is that there are, it is not uncommon for there to be missing references, for there to be typos in the data, for there, for, for there to be anything. In fact, if we, here, I'm, I want to jump back to this, like uh, this one. I, 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 that's actually in the CVE data, right? Like there's a bunch of weird descriptions like that because the CNAs provide the descriptions and then who, who takes care of them after that. And it's hard to update today. But this is one of those instances where when you have a namespace, anyone can update anything. And it's in GitHub, so anyone can, can submit pull requests to anything. You can't touch these, though, because these are an automated process that pulls them in. They're, they're read-only from our perspective, which is great, because there's no reason we shouldn't be able to pull data from other places, for example, and one, stick them in. One last quick addition for this, too, is this is where we can support multiple formats. So if you have a format that your company mm -hmm. uses specifically or whatever your uh, project is using, you can put that in your own namespace. And folks can consume that knowing because it's on the specific namespace, I know to expect this format. Yep, yep, exactly. And in fact, this is like that. So the terrible GSD format I made up, there's also an OSV token. You see, I, I think this has, uh, there's GSD up there. There's also an OSV on the newer ones because I, I rewrote my parser. But like, that's the OSV format. Anyone could submit a pull request to that. But then like, if you, if you take the cve.org namespace, it's literally the CVE JSON. If you take the nvd.nist.gov namespace, it's literally their JSON. And that's the intent, is it is stupid to say everyone has to do it our way or else, right? There's many ways to do this kind of stuff, and so that's one of the things. And additionally, we recognize that all of this will evolve as the community works on it. There's no single answer, but I know hopefully we'll converge on some good ideas. Like if, if I was in charge, oops, sorry, if I was in charge, everything would be OSV, because I love that format. Well, I love it today. In, in a couple of months, I might decide I don't like it. I don't know. I go back and forth on things all the time. But, you know, it, it's kind of one of those things. Like, it's a really cool project that's doing really cool stuff. All right. Anything else? Um, one of the things is being able to play with the data as well. So if we want to explore new data formats, put it under an experimental namespace, mm -hmm. see if it works, try it out in practice. Works great, doesn't kill it. Yep, so. that's right. That's right. And it's kind of that whole open source model, right? Like, move fast and break things, sort of where there's no reason we can't try crazy new things. And uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, and that's okay. Uh, right, Speaking oh, I of. move fast and break things, look at that. Mm -hmm. So one of the other, well, you, you, you built this, you talk about this. Uh, so I built the... <laughs> the purple one. <laughs> the purple one, very questionable UI. Uh, I am not a UI designer, so uh, if open anyone, source model. If any of you can help with UI, like, please. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so the idea is being able to support not just vulnerability 
researchers and the folks that are really into this, but also giving a easy to use public interface for being able to edit this. If you're a member of the press or just somebody in the public, being able to go in and fix a typo or something like that should be quick and mm -hmm. easy to support. Um, and then okay. along those lines, also being quick and easy to create new IDs. So if you found something, it doesn't actually exist yet, go ahead and use the request form. And I guess you built the request form. Do you want to talk about it? I did build that. It's, uh, it's a very bad form. The only thing I will say I did is you can't see it, but the description is, is as you fill in details, it starts filling the description out for you, which is like, I'm not good at, at JavaScript, and that took me a, a really long time to do. So I'm very proud of it. But you can go to, um, what is it, request.globalsecuritydatabase.org. We probably have a link later. We can, we can send it to you if you want. But in, in like literally, anyone can request IDs, and that's the way it should be, right? It should be, what? Mm -hmm. Then we would defer to the CVE format, and we would the uh, intent would be we would take mark the GSD as basically like an alias of the CVE, and then we just point right at that. Yeah, that's the intent. Yeah, Chris. Is your intention to uh, share GSD information so specifically that it's embargoing? We're not working with embargoes at all. I don't want embargoes. Embar I mean, so we can, we can, it's, it's public. And we can, we can argue philosophically if embargo should exist or not, but from my perspective, it's very expensive and hard to do. And here's the thing, the reason we don't care is because if you can get an ID in five seconds, just get the ID when you go public, right? Like that's kind of the intent there is, the reason embargoes exist today, I think, is because the current system is too slow to accommodate something like that, right? So get an ID, like hit publish, grab your ID, update your advisory. Or just grab the ID, you know, the 10 seconds before you publish or whatever. And is there any validation that the reporter is contacted the maintainer and they have to Absolutely not. It is, it is public data. If the reporter doesn't contact a project, like that's on them. It's, I, I'm, I don't, is that, I mean, is that something that happens now where there's any sort of verification that someone requesting an ID from a CNA contacted an upstream? I, I suspect there isn't. Yeah, well, if the, if the CNA is responsible, sure. Yeah, uh, yes. Sure, 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 right, right, okay. One quick addition for that too is this is where namespaces, you could filter out, say you only want to look at the GitHub security advisory as an NBD or whatever combination of data feeds that you want to look at. You can limit it to the specific subsets because the focus is having machine readable data. So. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Also no humans. Humans are bad at everything, right? <laughs> uh, we also have multiple ways to request IDs. So one of the things we do is we work with the Linux kernel. And this is where we kind of explain where we start getting fundamentally different from the way a lot of this happens today. So the Linux kernel, uh, Sasha Levin, who works, he's the, the stable branch maintainer for Linux kernel, I'll sneak in front of you. And he has an ML job that he runs against the kernel tree before release, and it looks for commits that are potentially security relevant, right? Now, as security practitioners, we probably hear something like that and we cringe because this is anything like has a word security in it is probably gonna get tagged, even if it's like a document update, whatever. But we don't care. And so Sasha sends, I think on this, this picture, I can't see my little screen, I've got, yeah, 1,562 IDs were requested by them in one go for one kernel release, right? That's a lot. But it's not meant to be individual IDs we obsess over. I think we exist in this security vulnerability space today where we have an intense focus on singular IDs versus having a more aggregated view of things and saying this version of this project has this many potentially security relevant commits, right? Which is a different way to think about all of this. And so this data isn't meant to be, like if you wanna obsess over singular commits, like that's what CVE does, that you go work with them, that's where you do this. What we want is to have a, a, a broader view where you can think of it more like a heat map, right? Where you've got different versions having different security relevant commits. And my example of this is if you search on GitHub for buffer overflow in double quotes in the little search box, you get 9 million issues in GitHub. There are 200,000 CVEs since the beginning of time. So think about that. Now, all 9 million aren't 
security bugs, that's easy to say, but how many of them are, right? Is it a million? Is it hundreds of thousands? We have no idea. And so this is one of those places that we want to start being able to do interesting automation and start capturing more of this data and having good ways to filter it out. And this is again where some of the ideas behind namespacing and machine readability come into play. Because depending upon your risk profile, depending upon your use case, you might wanna say like, I don't care about these crazy kernel issues. They don't affect me. It's not something important. What's that? Sorry, no, jump in, jump well, in. Um, I talk a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Just trying to keep us on time. So I guess we can move on to the next one, which is talking about uh, the quantity versus quality yeah. of the data. Yeah, definitely, thank kind you. Kind of what you're getting into there. No, go for it, please, please. Um, so yeah, we can't be overly rigid. We have to support both the large quantity data, but not necessarily sure that it's uh, accurate. Uh, versus we want only the things that don't have false positives because it's going to waste a lot of our time if we have uh, anything that flags. Um, and then also lots of different personas, so it's not just the developers, not just the security researchers, but um, the press as well, people that are making these tools for automation. Um, I guess anything you wanted to? I mean, I have a great story for this actually, that, that there was, uh, it was when I was at Elastic, there was an NVD result that had the version wrong. It was something like it affected 3. Dot, it, was, it was like version 2 to 3.0.13 or something like that. And they marked it as like version 3.13, right, in, in NVD. And so I go to NVD and I, I go to their, I send an email and I'm like, hey, you got this CPE wrong. And they're like, oh, that's because of the description in the CVE is wrong. You have to go fix the CVE. And I'm like, all right, fine. So I go to MITRE's forum, I type it in, I explain what's wrong. Then they come back to me a couple days later and say, oh, you have to talk to the CNA to get this wrong. And I'm like, Ugh! So you know what I did? I went on Twitter and I complained and then the CNA fixed it because they saw me on Twitter complaining. Like, no, <laughs> don't do that. So anyway, that's kind of the point, right? Is there, there's these different aspects to this. And this is where like, I, I put up there like CISA, the known exploitable vulnerability catalog. If any of you have seen that, this is where CISA has a list of Vulnerabilities they know beyond a reasonable doubt are being exploited, right? It's a small list, it's well curated. Like we know that list is extremely high quality, but we also know CISA can't do that for like millions of issues. Assume, let's hope there aren't millions of issues being, being actively exploited. But you know what I mean? Like that's a good example of like, that is a very specific use case for very specific data. And that's an instance where we can obsess over individual things. But now at the same time, we've got Jonathan Lightshoe in the back with the cool hat. He filed, what, 6,000? Right, he, he, right, thousands of pull requests for vulnerabilities he found, right? Like that's an instance where you have a lot of data and so you're not gonna look at it in the context of it being like very high quality, I'm gonna look at it individually, but rather we're gonna look at that in the aggregate and say like, what are all these issues Jonathan filed? What does that look like, right? And so they're just, they're very different use cases, but today, they have to live in the same place. And I think that that's problematic. And, and I think none of us would disagree with that. Anything else? Uh, I guess one last thing to add to that too is one of the reasons we call it the press is, for example, lock for shell really huge, but if you're a member of the press, you have really tight deadlines. Having a prose description that actually explains in layman's terms, what is this thing? That's something that we can support with a more flexible data format with the GSD. Totally. All right, we're almost done, we're almost done. This is it, all right. What now, right? We need help, it's an open source project. We want anyone who can help us to come help us because we think this is important and we think it matters. We've got a handful of folks who work on this now. There's, I, I recognize a couple of you in the crowd. Uh, we, have, we have meetings, we have GitHub repos, we have a mailing list, we have this thing called Circle that the CSA likes to use. It's kind of like an online mailing list thing. But I mean, fundamentally, our intent isn't to have meetings and get nothing done. Our intent is to run an open source project. And an open source project, the people who do the work make the decisions, right? Like that's just how it works. So I, I mean, come help, please. That, that's basically the whole point of why we're up here. And, and we want people to help us. We're, we're literally here, like begging everyone <laughs> to help us out. Uh, anything else? Yeah, I guess, like we were saying, just we want to put into practice what is needed rather than trying to theory craft this. So, come help us mm -hmm. figure out what it is that is actually needed and implementing that's right. that. And we're gonna screw up a lot. We're gonna make mistakes and that's okay. Like that's the point, right? We wanna try things. 
Jonathan. How do you deal with bad actors? Somebody that comes in and generates thousands of issues. I mean, I, no, that, that's a great question. His question is like, what do we do about bad actors? What if someone shows up and, and generates thousands and thousands of issues? I mean, that's certainly a possibility. So the way we do it today, I, I'm not going to zoom back. Uh, you have to have a GitHub login to interact, right? Like the web forms make you log in with GitHub or you submit pull requests via GitHub. And so because of that GitHub ID, we can obviously identify who the people are, like, cause you're gonna have the same ID. And I think that, I think generating lots of GitHub IDs is probably, I'm not gonna say it's impossible, but that's a pretty high bar. So fundamentally, like if, if someone with a certain username is basically spamming the, the system, we'll, we'll ban them and we'll just delete all their stuff. You know, it's, it's GitHub, it's easy to do that. Yes, and, and the gentleman here said, you know, you can look at age of I GitHub IDs and things like that. And yeah, definitely. Like if there's an ID that's, you know, five minutes old and just submitted a pull request with 7,000, you know, I IDs or whatever, like, no, that's not, that's not gonna fly. Yeah, and to kind of hammer home the namespaces thing too, this is where if you are concerned about having <laughs> bad actors like that, then you can consume just the other vulnerability databases that are within GSD uh, and right. just ignore all the random researchers that might be uh, you don't know necessarily uh, the quality or trust levels there. And, and part of it too is like, we're gonna figure this out as we go. I mean, how does the Linux kernel avoid people spamming it, right? They seem to have done a pretty good job. Most open source projects do, but not all. So, anyway. Uh, do we have any time for questions? We, oh, we got it. Well, there's, not, there's a break after this, so I'm happy to hang out and answer questions as long as any of you want. Uh, does anyone on like, I don't know if there's any other virtual questions, does someone have access to that or? Okay, great, great, great. Any other questions? All right. Um. Absolutely. Okay, so the question was, is there room for capturing some of the nuance for disputes? And the example being, there are instances where vendors, we'll say, are less than honest. There's instances where you might have a researcher pushing an agenda. There's many, many things we've seen in this space. And th this is the whole point of, this is why we came up with the namespaces, was literally for this reason, because how many of us have read the stories where a researcher reports something and the vendor says, oh, that's, that's low, that doesn't count, right? That's no big deal. And then the researcher publishes information and all of a sudden everything lights on fire because oh, it turned out it actually was quite serious. And this is one of those instances where if a researcher has a namespace and a vendor has a namespace, they can both add their data and then as consumers of the data, we can make decisions about like, what are we going to do about this? Like for example, if, if one vendor says not an issue, a, res a researcher I trust says it is an issue, I might be more inclined to lean on that researcher's commentary in that instance. But yeah, that's a great question. All right, I'm gonna pick on Alan next because he had his hand up and then we'll come to you. Alan. So I almost wanna ask the opposite of that question. Yeah. Right now, the entire tool ecosystem, the entire governance structure that we have, lots of regulations, mm -hmm. are built on pretty turnkey compliance, um, which we find annoying because it doesn't capture the nuances that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can this still accommodate that as we slowly build out policy, both computer policy and public policy, that actually can capture the nuance that all the work leaders are not seeing? Yeah, so Alan's question was basically there's, we'll say, not a lot of nuance today in the vulnerability data versus how do we go from what we have today to kind of where we go. And I would argue, I mean, this is why we made it compatible with CVE because I think CVE is solving the problems of today, no questions asked. But then, because of that compatibility, there's no reason that needs to drastically change as we migrate ourselves into the future. And, and that's kind of the intent of that. Uh, I knew you had a question, sir. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm not clear on, like, what does discourse look like on this, and what does update look like on this? Well, I'm sort of picturing it, almost a comment for that. So discourse, explain what you mean by so, discourse. So suppose someone posts, you know, an uh, uh, initial vulnerability. Yep. Um, what does it look like to add to that? Um, are we all just updating, you know, one, one uh, block 
lack of data or, or are we... Ah, so you're saying, let me, let me repeat the question to make sure I understand this. So the question was basically, so let's say there is an identifier in the system and, and you want to add metadata to it. Sure. What does that look like? So today it looks like a pull request, <laughs> which you could edit the like top level GSD section. You can't edit the CVE or the MVD section. Those are, because those, it's an automated process that'll override any changes you might do. So we reject those. Or you could add your own namespace and do whatever you want. Like you could, you could decide I'm going to rewrite every description as haikus. Yeah. And that's fine, like great. I have no problem with that. Like we, we can argue the, the necessity of it. But, and so that's the long term, we want to have like nice tooling that, you know, you can open a form, look at something, oh, there's a typo here, like I'm going to fix this typo and then hit submit and then how that all works out, we don't, and part of it is building this because we don't have all the answers today and I'm happy to acknowledge that. So I think that's all the time that we have. Are, are we, are they giving us the hook? They did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's break time now. If anyone wants to hang out and chat more, like I, I'd love that, that's great. And if not, like we're here for the, you're, are we done? You can just turn us off. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Ah, so the online question was, can anyone submit any request to any namespace, or are the GitHub IDs associated with the namespace? We do not have an answer to that question right now. We argue with it back and forth every possible way you can imagine. I would say today, Humans are approving the pull requests. So if you try doing something silly, it's not going to be approved. But if you say edit another namespace that isn't a read-only namespace, but if you edit another namespace with like a typo, like changing an a uh to an an, I suspect that would make it through. But again, this is also where part of the goal of this is to build a community and start asking these kind of questions and coming up with, with plausible answers for how should this work. Anything else? Can we get the links again? Uh, yeah. So here, I'll put this slide up for anyone. So there's a, a shortener thingy here, this GSD dash quick links. Ah, that's really bright. Um, and if you want, just hassle me and I can, I can give it to you too. We could put it on Twitter or something maybe. But that has links to all the things we've talked about. They're all there. And uh, yeah, yeah, there's also, oh, there's also a Slack, yep. which is very new and very few people are in it. That's part of the CSA that required me convincing Kurt that he has to open the Slack up to everybody. And I did it, I wore him down. We have it now, like, so. I persevered. <laughs> so yeah, consider this an announcement. So you can join the Slack. All right, anything else? All right, let's end this, but come, come chat. All right, I can touch this now and hopefully not ruin anything. <laughs> not be terrified that it's gonna turn That's off. Right. Hello. Hi. Never come back on. My name is Alma. Hello, Alma. Hi. And I am a member of Women in Cyber Security. Awesome. And we're getting a, we're working on getting a bug bounty for our members. Mm -hmm. and